This message has been brought to you freely by Ecclesia Kingdom Movement. To support our ministry and partner with us to increase our impact across the world, reach more people and take advantage of more platforms, we encourage you to consider making a monthly gift of any amount or one-time gift towards the work of the gospel. We'd like to thank you in advance for your support and we value your partnership. Right, mark your Bible in two places with me this morning. First of all, go to the book of Genesis chapter 1. Someone say Genesis. Say chapter 1. And then I want you to put your Bible with me as well in the book of Isaiah 43. Um, News flash. We'll be putting our Bibles there. Well, if I'm preaching anyway, this year, if you sit down in the service where I preach this year, the odds are that we'll be reading from both or one of these scriptures. Amen. Someone say amen. Um, is there anybody here who is not on the WhatsApp group uh, called EKM Missions Worldwide? Anybody here? Okay, if you're not, please see me or someone else after the service so we can add you to that. If you don't have WhatsApp, let's believe God for you to get it. Amen. I don't mind paying your subscription. It's about 60p, right? I think I can afford that. Amen. Uh, but there's some very important stuff that... Uh, I intend or we intend to pass out across that medium this year. For instance, we've been, uh, I've put out a few scriptures over the last week or so that I believe during this period of fasting. How many of you are looking forward to fasting? How many of you have already started? Okay, one or two, wonderful. It's good, isn't it? There, there, there's a special grace for this one, though, isn't it? It's just easy. I think everybody knows it's, diff- it's easier. I can't explain. It's just easier to fast this year. It's a new beginning, isn't it? Um, but I want you to focus on, I want you to read the book of Isaiah from chapters 40 to 66. Amen. Um, Isaiah is called the mini Bible. It has 66 chapters. Amen. How many books in the Bible? Hint, hint. How many of you knew it was 66 before I just said so? Okay, one or two. Um, if you look at it, the first 39 chapters kind of look like the Old Testament. There's plenty of woe and trouble and there's a few bright spots, but the first the nine chapters are the story of the problem. And then the last, what's 66 minus 39? 25, right? Come on, talk to me, right? Okay, Simon's going to talk to me. I'm going to school. Oh, anybody else want to talk to me? Privilege, where's pri- oh, there you are. Okay. 27. So the last 27 chapters are full of New Testament stuff. For instance, chapter 40 is just beautiful. In fact, if you read the book of Isaiah, when you get from 39 to 40, you feel like you're in a different book altogether. And the Lord said to me that the last 27 chapters of Isaiah are his promise to us this year. Amen. Especially chapters 40 to 50. Those are deep. I'm going to say deep. Chapter 43 is just beautiful. Shondai, chapter 45 is my personal life's assignment. When God called me, he spoke to me from chapter 45. And there's other wonderful stuff. But today, I want to look at 43 and Genesis chapter 1. Uh, we were in Genesis the last time I was here in Sheffield. Who remembers what we spoke about? We talk about new beginnings, right? How they're not always nice and cuddly at the beginning of the beginning. Um, I took it further in London. This is how I explained it. Um, Remember, it went this way. Okay, let me read the chapter so that anybody listening to this doesn't say, I didn't go to Bible college and I don't know how to preach. You know, I've heard some funny people recently say, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't read from the text. I'm like, the Bible says I should write the word of God on my heart, right? Meaning if I write some, I read something from where it's written, isn't it? So if it's primarily written on my heart, I should be able to read it from my heart, shouldn't I? Newsflash. Did I just deliver somebody? You know, you can study the Bible without actually opening the book. Have you ever just been walking down the street, just chewing on a scripture you read a while back, and boom, something hits you right between the eyes? In fact, sometimes while you're reading it, it's hard to get Rema because you're so focused on what you're seeing. But meditation takes it off off the page into your heart where it can be chewed and released with power and, and clarity. 
Amen. So if we can study the Bible without looking at it, we should be able to read from it without looking at it. Amen. But for the sake of those who may or may not have a problem with that, obviously nobody here. No Pharisees here, right? Okay, nobody's too far to see. Or too sad to see. Okay, good. In the beginning, God pre- Now, I'm reading for the Amplified Version. In the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, God, in bracket, prepared, formed, fashioned, and created the heavens and the earth. Look at that. Prepared, formed, fashioned, and created. Four words. Someone say four words. Come on, look at me. Look at me. Talk back to me. Amen. Prepared, formed, fashioned, and created the heavens and the earth. So he prepared it, right? He formed it. He fashioned it. And he created it. Not necessarily in that order. If I were to arrange it myself, I would say created, then prepared, then formed and fashioned. But there is a lot more to creation than just the prophecy of God over your life. Paul says to his son, Timothy, in the New Testament, he says, my son, Timothy, by the prophecy that I placed. Now, this is the father's blessing. Nothing is more powerful in scripture. But he's saying even the blessing of a father is not qualified or guaranteed to come to pass concerning your life. He says, I need you to war with it. Someone say war with it. War. He says, wage a good warfare. I've always said, Chris, the, the kind of warfare that is good to me is when I win. If we have a fight and you punch me up, it's not good, is it? Good. So he says, wage a good warfare with the promise. Someone say with the promise. Say with the promise. So in the beginning, God prepared, formed, fashioned, and created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and an empty waste. This is deep. And darkness was upon the face of the very great deep. The spirit of God was moving in bracket, hovering and brooding over the face of the waters. You said this before, Jesus can be in the wedding of Cana and the wine is finished and he will do what? Absolutely nothing. Come and talk to me. The Bible says in the New Testament that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, right Jeremy? Good. Far above all, someone say all, we can ask, someone say ask, say think, say imagine, according to the power that is available to you. Is that what the Bible says? According to the power that has been given to you, according to the power that has been imparted to you, according to what? The power that is at work. Where? Where? Does it say through you? Think about it. Does it say by you? Does it say to you? So there is a power that is being engaged. Someone say engaged. It's being actively embraced. It's being utilized. Not by you, but... Hello. Did you catch that? The Bible says he upholds all things by the word of his power. The words that I speak to you are spirit and life. This cannot be the anointing because the anointing is upon you to do. The Bible says how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. And he went about all the earth doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil. Are you with me? The Bible says that they should go to Jerusalem and be and wait or tarry till they are endued with power from on high. And with that power, they should go and be his witnesses. So this cannot be the kind of power God is talking about. This is not prophetic power. It's not healing power. It's not preaching power. It's not handling power. It's, it's, not, it's simply something that is working on the inside of you. And the Bible says that God can do for you to the limit of what you allow him do in you. Ponder on that for a second. God can do for you to the limit of what you allow him do in you. Everybody say that with me. God can do for me to the limit of what I allow him do in me. Say it one more time by yourself. One more time. Look at your neighbor, say to them, God can do for you 
Yes. One more time. Why am I asking you to repeat this over and over again? Because I want you to get it till you're sick and tired of hearing it. Point to me. Say it to me. <laughs> okay. God can do for me. Or even through me. To the limit of what he's allowed. Somebody say allowed. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 45 or chapter 43, which we'll read in a second. God says, I will work and who can let it? The word let means hinder. It's an old English word, meaning I will work and who can stop me? Um, when we read these things, you see, God is not as deep as some of us think he is. He's deep, but he's not. God is spiritual. He's not spirit. Some of us are a lot more spiritual than God. A lot deeper than God. I was talking to somebody recently who was telling me about some of their plans and everything. And I was like, so what's God saying? Like, well, you know, there's this option, that option. And you know what? Obviously, so this must be God's will. I'm like, who told you God's will has to be the the painful one? You know, so there's a fine, you know, come on, someone talk to me. There's a fine girl who is well behaved. There's another fine girl who is horribly behaved. Must God tell you to marry the horribly behaved one so you can he can use you to <laughs> come on now? <laughs> you know, some people's logic is just deep. You know, and, and, and I want to make this very clear because you know sometimes, you know, you know, the problem with preaching is this. I've said this a billion times. I try, but you know, I, I try to do this a lot better than the people who've gone before me. But every generation makes mistakes which the following generation has to correct. You know, and I don't think I'm an exception. You have one hour to preach to 50, 100, 200, 1,000 people at different levels with God, dealing with different things, and every one of them wants to hear God. It's very difficult to bring complete balance to one sermon. And worse still, some of us go to the bathroom during the sermon, fall asleep during the sermon, check our Facebook during the sermon, remember Arsenal is playing Man United, although they always lose when they play us during the sermon. You know, and so certain things, and then we all hear through the prism of who we are, what we're going through, and where we're coming from. And so when we hear stuff, a thousand words might be said and you live with 50. And since in this generation we don't take notes anymore, I know we're different here, right? Where are your notes? Okay. And people would rather spend 20 pounds on Nando's than 5 pounds on a CD from church. Even when your church, hint, hint, makes it free, just ask for the mp3 that rhymes you know and so people don't usually form a perspective on stuff and let me make this very very clear god is a good god you know Amen. i said god is Amen. a good god Amen. and god is not as de- see the bible says if you're going to accept the kingdom or going to enter the kingdom sorry you must come in as a little child and if you understand hebrew culture the word child means 13 and younger the moment you clock your 13th birthday hint hint Amen. So there's only what four or five children in this room or in this church right now. The rest of you are grown men and women. Say, I'm still growing up at 27. God, shut up and sit there. You know, I remember when I was well, I had a friend, she was about 25. We're talking about something. She was like, you know, like, like that we need to leave. What happened like that? She had to like talking to me on the phone and said, hold on. I said, what happened? So I needed to leave the room. The adults wanted to talk. I like you're 25. Your master's degree graduate. And the adults, I'm like, okay. Um, I'm like, next time I come to your house, please leave the room. <laughs> God is simple enough to be understood by a 13 year old. Literally, whatever a 13 year old can understand about God isn't required. I'm not saying they're not parts to him, but it's not fundamental. You don't need it to enter his kingdom. Can I repeat? Whatever a 13-year-old cannot grasp is not fundamental to the kingdom of God. And the Bible is not as deep as some of us think. It's actually very literal. God asks the question, I will work. Who will stop it? Very simple answer, you. It's not a rhetorical question. I will work. He says, who will let it? You. The Bible talks about the Israelites in the wilderness. It says they limited the Holy One of Israel. Someone say limited. God has no limits except the ones we place on Him. 
they limited. Paul says, I labored so that the grace of God would not be in vain. Meaning grace can be poured out in vain. And there are many ways we limit God. The Israelites limited him by unbelief. The, apostles, the other apostles other than Paul limited him, him by laziness. Because no matter how gifted you are, if you don't apply. Amen. 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 Come on now. No matter how gifted you No matter how annoyed I am. If I don't ever lay hands, can I ever see any? Come on, talk to me now. No matter how brainy I am, if I don't ever revise, can I? No. Or, or attend classes in the f- 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 first place. Oh, come on now, someone talk to me. You know? Someone was limiting by a character or lack thereof. Come on. Are you with me now? Are you with me? Are you with me? Look at Isaiah chapter 45. Verse 18. I'm going to read from the King James Version. The Cambridge edition King James Version. As opposed to the Oxford one or the Imperial one. Um, that was a joke by the way. For, th- ha, ha, ha. For thus saith the Lord. Someone say saith. Yeah. Now I, I don't know if I've taught you guys this in Shepherd before. But there's different dimensions of prophetic utterance. Sayeth is not past tense. Sayeth in English, to, today's English means thus is saying. The Lord. That's why I always tell prophets, be careful. The fact that he said it to you yesterday and you're repeating it today does not mean he is saying. When you put the phrase, thus saith the Lord before a word, you are literally saying he is using my lips to talk right now. So if he spoke to me yesterday and I wrote it down and I'm reading it today, it does not qualify for thus saith the Lord. So I can forgive error in any prophecy as long as you don't attach thus. Because if you say thus, say it means God right now is using you to talk. Now, I do understand humanity can still come into it. I do understand that you know, the spirit of a prophet is subject to the prophet. I get all that. But what you're saying is this is a fresh download from heaven. This is hot off the press. Extra, extra, read all about it. Amen. So next time, so next time we say thus said the Lord, that's fine. Right? But if you say thus say yeah, that means God is saying right now. And God understood that the Bible would be read 20, 30, 40, 1,000, 2,000 years from then. And so every phrase you see in the Bible where it says thus say it the Lord, what God is saying is I didn't just say it then. Because the whole Bible was written by inspiration, wasn't it? The Bible says, holy men wrote as inspired by God. So the entire Bible literally should be thus saith the Lord. True? But if he took the time to tell them to write thus saith, what he's saying is this thing I said, I will say tomorrow. So he's saying every time you ask me concerning this thing, this is what I will be saying. Does that make sense? Should we go home now? Okay, no. For thus saith the Lord, which Lord that created the heavens? Not the heavens and the earth that created the heavens. Semicolon. God himself that formed the earth. Take the, take the effect down. And made it. So he's saying this is the God that is talking. He created the heavens. Because God had to separate the heavens from the earth here. Because he realized that he'd succeeded in maintaining order over heaven. But the earth was a different story. Does that make sense? So indirectly he's saying, hey, I'm the same God that bought this keyboard. So if I bought some ragtag one for 20 pounds, don't judge me based on that alone. Does that make sense? Have you ever had to separate stuff in your life and say, you know, I mean, it will never happen to any of us in this house in Jesus name. But some parents have to remind their friend that that's my child as well. Because one child is so messed up. Have you seen that before? Have you seen families where there's like four wonderful children and there's just one child of God? Come on, talk to me. You know, and the parents have to remind you, don't judge me based on this one. Because I also raised those four. (laughs) When I was growing up, they'd have disowned you, literally. You know, thank God for grace, for a God who doesn't disown us. Thank God for a God whose love for us completely unconditional 
And if you were blessed to have a biological parent or, or family member, or even a spiritual leader who has to an extent revealed that love, then bless God because humanity is messed up, man. Hey, look at your neighbor and say, you messed up. Tell them, say, it's all right. I, I still love you, but you're kind of messed up. Mm, yeah, kind of messed up. Thus said the Lord who created the heavens, comma, or colon, the God who also, my addition, formed the earth and made it. He has established it. Hello? He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. Hello? You might not understand where I'm going, but when we go back to Genesis 1, you get this. He says, hey, I made the heavens, so I have a track record, right? I also made the earth. I know right now it doesn't look that good, but I made it, I created it, and formed it to be inhabited. Meaning there was a purpose in my mind when I made it. It was supposed to be good. Now go back to Genesis chapter 1 with me, and let's look at verse 1 and 2, because there's a contradiction going on here. Someone has to explain something to me. The Bible is the word of God. Then on the surface, these two scriptures don't make sense. Does that make sense? (laughs) On the surface, they don't make sense. Because in the beginning, God prepared, formed, fashioned, and created the heavens and the earth. And we were told in Isaiah 45, 18, that he created the earth to what? He created it to what? To what? But look at verse 2. The earth was without form and empty waste and darkness was upon the face of the very great deep. Does that look like something God created to be inhabited? Something's fishy or chickeny or whatever. I don't like fish. I prefer lamb myself. What is lammy? <laughs> See, if you read Genesis chapter 1, you, you kind of get this idea that you know what? God made the heavens and the earth and, and then he took him a long time to figure out what to do with the earth. So he was so busy renovating heaven that he just kind of left the earth, you know. But no, he made it to be. So what happened between verse 1 and verse 2? I don't know how long it was. Some scholars believe that Satan fell in between those two verses. Maybe that's why he still survived. Because I thought if someone fell from heaven to the earth, they kind of break their bones, wouldn't you? Or maybe it was a short fall from one line of the Bible to another. <laughs> But they believe Satan fell in this time. They believe, I mean, it makes sense to me. Because whatever disorder touches becomes disorder. When something has a spirit. How many of you know people who when they walk into the room, you get depressed? They just walk in and you, does that make sense? When a person has so yielded themselves. Come on, talk to me. How many of you know people who just being around makes you happy? You just seen them. Like Carmen. Where is Carmen? Uh, you just, just seeing Carmen just makes me smile. It just makes me smile. You know? I have friends who when I'm broke, I just talk to. I don't ask them for money. I just spend 20 minutes talking with them. And I'm inspired to prosper. Amen. And then so, I, I, try it. Talk to me when you're broke. <laughs> no, seriously. I'm good, man. I'm good, my man. Receive it. <laughs> but somehow, some way, God will have mercy. Blood of Jesus. A song just popped from like 20 years ago. Some of you are too, actually, it's not that old. It's not that old. It's like 15. Uh, you know, somehow, some way, we've got to make it out the hood someday. You know, uh, blood. Someone say blood of Jesus. But but somehow, some way, somewhere in the hood, someday, the earth ended up. Without form, an empty waste, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. But the Spirit of God was still brooding over the waters. When I read this the first time with Revelation, I was angry at God. Well, you never get angry at God, right? You're just born spiritual. Just tell the Lord I love you. You can kill me, but I still love you. How about you, but me and God have real talk. Come on, we got a real talk going on here. And I let him know how I feel. With respect. Because he can kind of kill me on the spot. But you know. And then when I. Before I say something. I'm like. Remember I'm a father of two. You know. Just, you know and a wife of one. A wife husband. Sorry. Of one. You know. But. <clears throat> See.
see, let me, let me help you guys out. I don't know who I'm talking to prophetically, but I just I feel that flow in my spirit when I know God is speaking to someone or people in particular. Um, you know, when, when my when my first son was born, you know, all my friends, because I, I was one of the last of my friends to get married and one of the last to have children. So all the ones that had gone before me kept telling me, you know, when you have your first child, you'll understand God. God will make sense. Does that make sense? <laughs> you know. You know, when I had my first child, yeah, God made sense for like 24 hours. And then I spent weeks being angry at him. No jokes about it. My, my, Kadesh almost destroyed my relationship with God. You know why? <laughs> <laughs> and in a way, almost also destroyed my relationship with the people who I considered fathers. Because in that moment of looking at my child, that pure primal human nature, to say, wow, I love you. I was angry at what I perceived to be in perfect fatherhood. For instance, I thought, how would my stepfather leave? How? I, it, 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 I began to wonder, what would make me leave this boy? So why would somebody leave me? Does that make sense? And I literally became angry until he started growing. And I started to realize that even with him, I wasn't perfect. Then God started making sense. First time I smacked him, God made sense. First time he cried and I was too tired to pick him up, God made sense. First time I knew he needed a change of diapers and I didn't have the energy to change them immediately, God made sense. Hello. Come on, someone talk to me. Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. How can you be there brooding over the mess that is my life? And do nothing. Anybody feel me? So you're there. And wine is running out. And you're chilling. I'm about to be embarrassed at my own wedding. And you're just sipping the last wine I have. My rent is due. And you have the audacity to ask me for an offering. Come on, don't talk to me. I've just failed an exam and you want me to go to church and sing. <laughs> Come on now. I know you guys have been here before. You don't look that spiritual to me, you know. I've seen spiritual people, but I kind of know people who are not that deep. And y'all don't look that deep, amen. <laughs> you look kind of like me, you know. You look kind of around my level, amen. So I, and I know I'm talking to the right crowd here. Just, 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 just ignore what the person around you thinks. Amen. They're not that deep too. Right? I know you think they're deep. You're trying to, you're trying, you know, you're trying to impress them, but they're not that deep. Look at them. Say you ain't deep. Say you ain't deep. I know who you is. I know what time it is. God is there. What he built is deteriorating. To a place where it is a wasteland. The spirit is just hovering. It's hovering. Brooding. In essence, I can feel you. But I can't see you doing anything. It's almost the opposite of my favorite worship song. This is my favorite worship song. I know I have many favorites. This is my favorite. I know it's not in you. I live more and have my being. I mean, but I love that song so much. It's actually made it into my book. I mean, when I wrote my dedication, I finished it with breathe through me, live in me. Okay, but that's not my favorite worship song. It's okay, you can have your song back now. I've rinsed it enough. I'm drying it out on the line now. <laughs> my, favorite, my favorite worship song is a song in a language called Yoruba. My mother's language. It says this in the original language. means the God who we cannot see, but whose works we can trace. You are worthy of glory. But there are times in our life where God does the opposite. Where we can see him. <laughs> Anybody here? You can, he's there. If I, you, you can point to the spot in your room when you pray where his presence is standing. Right? There is no doubt about his presence. But you're like, would you do something? You know, you, come on, now, like God, I'm being punched up in here. See, see, I, I'm going to use a very, very, very 
graphic analogy. And, you know, I've been told sometimes I need to be careful about things I say when I preach. But I'm just who I am. I know who I am. Amen. I'm just me. You want to be you, right? You don't want me to change you, do you? Don't change me too. I'm just me. Amen. And this will not happen to anybody. If they say, oh, when you say something. No, no, no. God knows. See, faith works by not just the words I say. It works by my spirit behind the words. The words are just an outlet. Does that make sense? So when I say we in English, I mean us. If I say we in French, I mean yes. God knows what I mean when I Does that make sense? Yeah. Faith is not accidental. Does that make sense? So if you say something, if you, if you don't know what the word means, for instance, if you have a wrong definition of a word, and you prefer, if you think that to link, I'll, I'll give you an example. First time I heard somebody say, you know, I want to link that girl. I thought, okay, you know, you want to hook her up with like a job, or, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it was explained to me what the word link means. And I'm like, Lord have mercy. I did not, see, I had not read, I still haven't read it. But then I went to Wikipedia what Fifty Shades of Grey was as a book. And I said, yeah. Can I get one particular sermon back? I was preaching new me. I'd heard about, I'd heard the book existed. I didn't know what the book was about. So I said, God is not black and white. He's 50 shades of gray. People are like, eh? eh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, mm. you know, and then like a year, it was in December last year that I Googled 50 shades of gray. And I went 50 shades of gray. <laughs> I thought, blood of Jesus. So, you know, my point is God knew what I meant. So he wasn't offended. So now that you've laughed, let me almost make you cry. Have you ever felt like God was a husband standing by while you were being raped? Just picture it. Not that he was tied up or held at gunpoint. No, he was just standing there. Just sat down there. So when he walked into the house, punched you, raped you, and he was just there. And then when the person left, he was like, are you okay? <laughs> you notice the married women aren't laughing. <laughs> it, it's funny to some of you, but the people who are married actually understand the gravity of what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? How many of you have honestly ever felt like that was God? The spirit is brooding over the waters, Chris. The same spirit that had the capacity to create or recreate the world when it was time was there for centuries. And, you know, like I said, God isn't that deep. Because when I first saw this, sometimes we want to defend him. Because we've grown up with this picture of God that is so nice and cute that got us to salvation that we feel the urge to defend that picture in our mind. And so when life begins to teach us of other sides of this God, we get offended at the thought that our God is not the teddy bear we thought he was. So we keep finding scriptures and principles to defend him. For instance, when I prayed for you, why didn't you get healed? It must be your fault. You didn't have faith. No! No, no, no. no. You know, I, I see... And, and I don't blame us. I blame we. Me now. I don't blame us. I blame we preachers. Because, because we, we want to be philosophers. We want to put God in a box. Mm, mm, mm. And so when we preach, we preach. See, see the, the older I get, the more open-ended my ministry is. My preaching is. I don't preach answers anymore. I preach questions now. Because... His ways are above my ways. His thoughts are above my thoughts. As far as the heavens are above, there's things I will never get about God on this side of eternity or the next. That's why the angels are still crying holy. They still don't get him. But we, we after 12 weeks in Sunday school <laughs> and discipleship class and two or three years at Bible college, we get him. You know, preachers are always asking ourselves, what's your doctrine? What's your theology? I don't have one. I don't have a theology. No, I don't. Because theology means the knowledge of God. I don't know him yet. At the end of his life, Paul said that I may know him. You don't know him. I don't know him. Moses says, I beseech you, show me your glory. You, Red Sea, quail from heaven. This was, a- come on. This was after he spoke to God. The Bible said like a man speaks to his friend. You haven't seen his glory. I'm saying, God, I surrender. <laughs> Paul, that I may know him. Guy, I am you. That's my mother's language for my life. 
road to Damascus, blinding light, visited the third heavens, all the epistles in the New Testament, handkerchiefs from his body, healing the sick. You don't know him. Sorry, yo. Sorry. So, someone say sorry. sorry. See, when we say God is good, you got to get this. You have to get this. Good. <laughs> Shaba. Doria. Koronomo Is a mosquito good? Yes, it is. It is a vital part of the ecosystem. A mosquito is needed for some plants and some parts of the ecosystem to survive. It's also needed to kill some parts of the ecosystem. Is it good that a lion eats an antelope? Yes. Otherwise, there'd be too many antelopes running around. Amen. You know, there's some fish that eat other fish. Yeah. And there's some animals who, when they mate, kill their mate. And it's always the woman killing the male. Oh, yeah. There's some, an- yeah, there's some animals where the woman is bigger, the female is bigger than the male. And, and, and literally procreation. You know, if that happened in the body of Christ, we would all say pure sexually. <laughs> Tiffany's like, oh Lord. <laughs> Why? Because it's the balance of life. Good doesn't mean what tickles your... <clears throat> The disciples said about a man who had been, you know, somewhere for 40 years, deformed. Who sinned? This man or his parents? Jesus didn't say, oh, don't that, that, that generation of nonsense doesn't. No, no. He says, no, normally it would be the case. But in this particular case, he didn't do nothing. His parents didn't do nothing. So why is it this way? That the glory, do you mean God would watch you in something for 40 years that his glory may be revealed? Yes. If you don't like it, you got a problem. I do too. I did too. But I realized hitting God, hitting my head against God, the wall called God isn't good for me. 40 years. For what reason? But that the glory. Meaning God could have healed him at any time in those 40 years. He just chose. There was no deep reason. There was no spiritual reason. There was no principle. There was no Amalekites. Be- no, 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 no. This wasn't about that. This- God just in his sovereignty decided not today. I'll be back in 40 years. Now we think that's horrible. But remember the God we deal with lives in eternity. And yesterday, today and tomorrow are one moment in his sight. It's 40 years to us. It's the same moment to him. Now this is only a joke. I think that was part of why God decided to come to the earth as Jesus. Because he thought, let me see how these people feel. (laughs) Notice how the way he dealt with us changed after Calvary. Notice that he was like, ah, you mean this is how it feels? Okay. And sometimes I want, you know, now this, no, don't ever joke about crucifying Christ twice. That is something very, very dear. To, no joke should ever go there. But there are times where I'm like, are you sure you really came? You seem, you know, it's been 2,000 years. You seem to have forgotten. You know, you want me to send you a video of your, can I send you Passion of the Christ? Can I upload that video to heaven so you can remember how it feels to be me? That, that's the difference between Old and New Testament. In the New, we have a high priest that is touched by the feelings of our infirmities because he's been through them, because he's been subject to time. But God, I'm not saying he doesn't understand us. I'm just saying, see, put it this way. This might, this might break your heart. God is not just your father. He's a CEO of a company uh-huh. called The Universe. Uh-huh. He has a company to run, mm-hmm. and all his employees are his children. Hello. So if you sat down there for 40 years blind and he formed means that she goes to heaven and she goes to heaven and she goes to heaven and they'd have gone to hell because otherwise then you know what Chris? <clears throat> Prayer is not always to get answers. Prayer is not always to get a result or a change. It's not even always to get an explanation. It's to get fellowship with the heart of God. And grace to move on. Regardless. That's what prayer is about now. Sometimes you get an answer. Sometimes the thing is dealt with. But that's not the primary focus of prayer. It's a good, I'm going to end in a good way. I know some of you are thinking. Oh Lord. PB. Why did you let him come today? No. It will end well. It will end well. It will end well. Amen. It will end well. Oh Lord Jesus. Mm. Maria de Bosch, Kabaya. The God's just 
brooding over the waters. And the Bible didn't say after a certain period of time. It didn't say after one year, one millennium, two eons. It just said, look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. I mean, see, if you read... Look at verse 3. And God said... Is there any chronological reason given for why he said? Is there? Come on, talk to me, talk to me. Talk to me, comment. Any reason? Do you see any reason there? Do you see, Mina, do you see any reason there? Yeah. Tiffany, any? No, just, he just woke up one day and thought, mm, you know what? Today would be a good day for light. So you're struggling with this, aren't you? Like, no, don't, 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 no, P.O., don't, don't heresify. My God, that's yours. Mine's the God of the Bible. I just go what the Bible tells me about him. I've, I've, I've destroyed all my, see, there's two things that I have, I have said I will never let be changed about God to me. That he is God and that he loves me. <laughs> Everything else is up for revelation. According to scripture. Of course, I will not let what he said be changed. That's different. What he has said is, is that you won't tell me that God says fornication is right. No. My point is about him, understanding him, he is God. He is just. Let me add that third one. He is just. Just doesn't mean that he fits our perspective of justice. Hello. Is it just to kill a human being? Is the death penalty just? Do you think it's just? Let's, let's have a debate here. Is it, is it right that because someone murdered someone else, they should die? No. The Bible says it is. Are you aware? And this is not Old Testament. God gives a reason that makes it just. And that reason is cross-testament. He says, if a man in cold blood, no, not accidentally... Not that they were fighting, not that in anger. If a man predetermined, for instance, a woman wants to get her husband's money and she hires hired assassins to kill him so she can get the will. He says, if a man in cold blood kills another man, he has destroyed the image of God. Bible says, meaning he has deleted me from the earth. He says, the punishment must be a life for a life. For that reason. The punishment for a crime tells us what we think about the value of the crime. So when a, when a cold-blooded murderer gets 25 years in prison and comes out after five, we have just told God our value on human life. Come on now. Look at America, for instance. Look at the... the, look at the the, the average of murder cases, of premeditated murder cases per head in the states that approve the death penalty and the states that don't. It tells you you need to know. Because if I know I can come out after five years, hey, come on, let's do this. Now, is it just? To us, no. To God, yes. Hello. Who wins? God. Is it just that a father who abused you, raped you, molested you, ignored you, mistreated you, called you ugly, I mean, messed up your life, he tells you to forgive? Is it just the human mind? No, I'll be honest with you. There have been people who have counseled about something, and once they left my office, I looked at God and said, you really mean you, are, you made me say that? I'm like, you, you, you stood by, I'm like, God, you, how, you, you made me tell a woman who has been, <coughs> that God hates divorce. I'm like, God, are you, are you that wicked? I'm just being honest. I'm like, okay, well, bleh. you know, see, what, when, when, when you see some worship leaders sing some songs, to you it's a song, to them it's a revelation. On the road marked with suffering, when there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. To you it's a nice song. I mean, when was the only one thing about it? Blessed be your, and we're dancing. You're actually dancing to that line. On the road marked with suffering, when there's pain in the offering, you know, two step, you know, you know, bless, you know. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to... There's some blessings that don't turn back to praise. Ask Moses how he felt to be blessed with three million people who wanted to kill him. 
When the darkness closes in, Lord, really? Still I will say, blessed be the name of the really? What do you think the guy who wrote that song was thinking when he penned that line? This particular song, um, when peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like pain billows means ocean waves. Have you ever gone through something where it felt like the pain was coming in waves? Other than pregnancy, that's one. But I mean emotional pain. Let me bring that for where it comes, then you think it stopped. And it comes like high tide. It, it, it's just systematic. And, and after one week, you think, I'm, I'm good. Then it just shows up, you know, and it's just assaulting you. And he says, Forever my love has taught me. Meaning he had to teach you. It takes teaching to say, not to feel, to say. Say to the righteous, it shall be well. God has to teach you to say, it is well with my soul. You know how the guy wrote that song? Have you heard the story before? Who said the story? His business collapsed. Right? Almost had a nervous breakdown. His wife convinced him they didn't take a vacation. They booked the cruise. Something came up at the last minute. He couldn't make the ship. Told them, you go. I'll meet you in a few days time. The ship sunk. With his wife and was it six or seven children on board? Completely. So business collapsed. Family wiped out. And while he was crossing, he'd heard. No, no, sorry. The wife survived. Children died. She sent him a... A telegram back in those days, you know, telegram. No, now that we have WhatsApp, I can know what you're thinking immediately. Does, you know, th- and thank God for those days because now sometimes most don't think before we press send. <laughs> you know, you put. <sighs> you have a friend who is. Bitter at God that she's still unmarried at 40. She's bitter at God, but she's smiling. She looks at you and your wonderful husband. And she, she doesn't, she's not angry at you. She loves you, but she's thinking, when will it be my turn? And then the day where she's crying, you Instagram, you and your husband at the beach. I'm, am I saying don't ever know? All I'm saying is there's a downside to every good side. And you wonder why you come back from your vacation and your friend is off for a day, for a day or two to you. Like, what's her problem? Your picture is a problem. And then you actually tagged her in and she was the first tag. You didn't know. You just, you know, you just, it could have been alphabetical, you know, but anyway. His name is Horatio. He's driving, or he's, or he's, on a, he's on another ship to meet his wife in hospital at the other side. And as the ship passes the remains of the ship his children died in. So that ship has broken up. It's floating. As he crosses the site of disaster, he writes the song, It is well with my soul. But we sing it as him, whatever, whatever number. I know today's him is number so and so and so. Haven't heard that quite That's the instrumental, and the voice is coming. When peace like a river attended my Horatio must be turning over in his grave. This is where the rubber hits the road. This, in my opinion, is where your see faith is substance and evidence. It's a walk because it does not come in totality on day one. Faith cometh. What cometh again is present continuous. It cometh, meaning it is consistently coming. By hearing and hearing is done or is achieved by interaction, the logos of God, also with the remor of God. 
It's the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of an eternity you cannot see. Faith means I have to act now with the absence of proof based on something I see when my eyes are closed that when I open my eyes disappears. The Spirit of God is brooding over the waters. And one day God just decides, you know what? It's time. I don't know how he figured it was time. I don't know. I wish I knew. I wish I knew what the formula was. And I would teach you. And it make my life easier. Oh, no, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I address something? Uh, uh, you know, please, I'm not, if I stand beside you, I ain't talking to you. Because this applies to me too. Many of us love God too much to be angry with him. Or we know better than to be angry with him. But if we sit down, we're really angry with God. It's God we're angry with. But we, we can't enunciate it. So we find a God representative and refer the pain. True? Come, true? True? Anybody here never done that before? My hands are down because I have. And a God representative is not always a leader. My wife is a God. You know why she's a God representative? Because God told me to marry her. So in court, she's God's fault. In court, what I'm not saying is she's a part of my life that reminds me of God. Because God says so. So sometimes when I'm really angry at God, she gets the brunt. Because I can't tell God I'm angry with him. I can't tell him I think he's failed me. I can't tell him I think he's, he's wasted my time. I can't, I can't say all that to him. But I can find a piece of my life that is going wrong that she's connected with. She's wondering, what, what, what have I done? You just agreed when God said to Mark. It makes sense. I, 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 you get what I'm saying? They're part of God in my life. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you know what, God? If I, I told, I told you guys before, half of the first two years of my relationship with Pastor Jackie, I literally thought she was Satan's agent to my life. I said, you know why? Because since she came in, I couldn't pray anymore. I could, you know, because the Bible says a single person is worried about the things of God. Don't be, don't be in a hurry to get married, though. <laughs> But a married person must worry. But I, as see, see, this is the thing, I, and I joked about this before. I said, it felt like, I, you know when you go to Amazon, you pick something in a catalog, but it comes out boxed. Then you get home, you open it, maybe it's, I felt like well, I, I got the wrong code. Because prior to getting together, she was deep, man. Called me to ask me what Habakkuk meant. Yeah, you are, you are, but, 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 but you got two children now, so you couldn't have been deep 24-7. But moving on, like I was saying, um, you know, what does Habakkuk mean and, and this and that? And, and all we ever talked about was the Bible, and she was asking me questions. And I thought, man, this is, this is the shizzy, you know? This is it, you know, like, aha, for rizzle, manizzle. Three weeks into us dating, she says something like, how are your jokes so scriptural? Oh. I'm like, come again. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 can't you crack a joke without... Um. <laughs> and you're always talking about this and that, and, and I'm sick and tired of hearing about this particular preacher that you always talk about. <laughs> She's like, she's real, oh Lord. You know? I'm like, you know, I'm just going to take a weekend to just seek the face of God and, and you know for three days, you know, I won't pick up my phone. I'm like, you cool? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two hours later, you horrible, wicked man. I'm like, She'll shoot me. She sent me a picture of herself. <laughs> Offended. She took a picture of her face uh. and picture messaged me in my prayer closet <laughs> while I was seeking. Uh, uh, we all know that three days became one day, right? <laughs> Was she the only thing wrong with my relationship with God? No. I was going through, th that one lasted 18 months. I remember when it started, it started with a visit by Pastor Adeboye to Sheffield to the church I was in then. It ended when I went to London for Festival of Life and he preached the exact same message both days, 18 months apart. Same text, same scripture, same example about fish. Just to let you know, it's nothing deep. And when he did the first one, God said, it begins. 
spoke to me audibly, called me Joseph. The only time I've heard his voice audibly, called me Joseph, woke me up from sleep, called me day, and I stood up, and he started talking to me and called me Joseph. And I thought, oh, my name is, you just called me my name. And he's like, no, you're about to go through a Joseph season. And then I went back to sleep, woke up the next morning, and it was like I was in an alternate universe. The heavens shut. I, I could feel the absence of God. And it happened for 18 months. And then 18 months later, I'm in London on a, in a borrowed car at Festival of Life. This was in 2007, I think it was. And it opens. But I knew better. So you hear my point? So I, my, my brain would not wrap. Now, did she do some? Oh, yes. Does that make sense? Did your biological father do so? Oh, yes. But it's not their fault that it is shapeless, formless, and dark. It's God's fault. I said it. It's God's fault. You heard me. You pick your jaw up the floor. I'm not going to die. Thunder's not going to strike me because I'm not saying anything that's untrue. It's God's fault. And part of faith is being real with God. Job's calamity did not turn until he spoke his mind to God. Now God rebuked him and corrected him. So God said, hey, can I put you in order? But see, God knows what you're thinking anyway. So you might as well say it. You're not going to be punished for, for, not, for saying it once you've thought it anyway. So get it off your chest. Did God give Satan a timeline when Satan came to him about Job? No. Gave him a boundary. Don't kill him. That's all. That, imagine. Can, can you imagine God saying that thing about you? Just don't kill him. Talk to the picture. You can do anything you want to. Break his legs. Break his nose. Just don't kill him. That's not very loving, is it? Especially when he just said, he's my guy. Hello. Yeah, God started a conversation. Have you beheld my servant Job? Be careful when God starts boasting about you. Maybe, you know, you know whenever you were teacher's pet in school, I was. So that person just gets 60s and just escape. When you start getting 90s and teacher starts bringing your script to class to say, see what Yemi wrote. What, I mean, I was in, I was in, I'm not sure, Yemi help me out. I'm not sure what it is in the, in the UK, but I was in primary three. What would that be in the UK system? How old are they roughly? No, 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 no. You're not 18. You're like seven in primary three. No, no, no. No, no, no. You're eight. It is eight. It is eight. Yeah, it is eight. Yeah. So, so yeah. Because then three, then three years. Li- no, actually you're nine. Yeah, you're about nine. You're about nine in primary three. So whatever year that is. Or, oh, you were deep. That's why you were teacher's pet. But, you know, imagine be, the, 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 Tiffany, what year are you in at, at, at nine years old? Four, fine. Tiffany says four, it is four. I believe her. I don't believe any of y'all. She's brainy. I know about y'all. So I'm in year four. And in year four, you were supposed to, we had this teacher, math teacher, who had a standard of timetables. And so you were supposed to have memorized your seven timetables by year four. So you had to memorize seven. So seven times, no, we, we, we sang it. Seven times one, seven, seven times two, there, seven times three, okay, seven, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I can't remember what's on there. Seven times four, twenty, seven times five, thirty-five, seven times six, forty-two, seven times seven, forty-nine, seven times eight, fifty-six, seven times nine, sixty-three, seven times ten, seven. We, we, we always like ten. Ten and eleven were easy. Because just put a zero or double the number, you know. So my teacher, to boast about me, come with Chris, brought me into year six. <laughs> and they were supposed to know their nine times tables. And to shame them, brought me from year four into the year six classroom and said, this is a year four student and this was his exact words verbatim. His name was Mr. George. I remember him till my dying day. 
he was Ghanaian in Nigeria. And said, and said, I have brought him to say the nine times table. And he added, just for your hearing. Guess what happened? I'd said nine times table a million times. That's why he brought me, because he knew I could say them. I froze at seven, at nine times seven. I just froze. And you know what he did? Which was not fair, but now taught me, or now I realized was teaching me about God. If you didn't say your timetables in class before the class started, he would flog you. He flogged me with the rest of them. Thank you, Chris. I was like, for, I said, can I say seven? He said, no. Literally, I was lined up with your, now, this was, it was bad because <laughs> not only did he flog me, they found me on the playground. They're like, oh, you're the, you're, the, oh, I was like, I'm sorry. And that prepared me for my lifetime walking with God. Have you seen my servant Job? He said, have you observed him? I look at the word. Have you observed him? Where are you coming from? He asks him up and down the earth. Okay, he's saying, if you went up and down the earth, I'm sure that guy would have stood out. And then he says, oh yeah, he did stand out. Yes, you know what stood about him? Your protection. Your hedge. Oh yeah, why wouldn't he glorify you when you... God says, oh, you really think that's why he is faithful to me? All right, take the head off. Pastor Alex once said to me, he said he told God once, said God, it's no wonder you have very few friends, seeing as how you treat the ones you do have. (laughs) And I'm like, Doc, I call him Docs, and I'm like, Doc, spot on. That's how I feel. Then Satan, think about it. Satan kills his children, destroys his livestock, comes back to God, and God says, You satisfied? But Satan says, No. It was okay to lose the children, it was okay to lose the livestock and the houses and touch his health. And God says, Okay. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you have thought that if God was good, after the first one, he would have said, this proves he loves me. Now I'm going to deal with it. No. I said, okay. And it'll interest you that when God eventually decided to turn it, there's no record of him discussing with Satan. You know why? You know why I believe this is me reading between the lines. Don't take this as doctrine. This is just my interpretation. You can throw it away if you want. Chew the meat Spit out the bones. I am of the opinion that Satan had surrendered the case to God before and said, I quit. This guy will not turn on you. But God did not turn Job's captivity immediately. Because according to the deal in, Gen- in Job 1, God should have said, Satan, are you satisfied? Now can we stop? I believe Satan stopped earlier. So why did God let it go on any longer? Because he wanted to have that conversation with Job. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to have a conversation with you when you get older. He wanted to have that conversation with Job. And at the end of Job 43, Job says, tell me Job 43, come on, come on, Job 43. This is the last chapter in the book of Job. I need this message myself once I'm done. It's going to be on repeat on my iPad for the next year. 43. Sorry, 42, sorry. <laughs> sorry, my bad. My bad, my bad. My, just, if I was going to lie, say just check in. You're here. What's the first word in the verse? You know those funny words I tell you about that when you see them at the start of something, check what came before? This is one of them. Then. If I say, then I told Kadesh, shut up. Something must have happened before. Like Kadesh was crying, he was whatever, whatever, then I... So, 
So what came before? Read the last few chapters. So where Job was informing God of his understanding of how things should be. Then God now responds to him with the last few chapters and literally rebukes him. Then Job said to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. Greatest man in the East. God testified about him 42 chapters ago. But now, then, he says, I know that you can do all things and that no thought or purpose of yours can be restrained or thwarted. Hello. No thought or purpose can be restrained or thwarted. Meaning, Job learned through his calamity that his calamity could not destroy God's purpose for him. Hello. That's, that's an oxymoron, isn't it? It's an, it's an anti... It took the trouble to teach him that the trouble could not destroy God's purpose for him. You said to me, Who is this that darkens and obscures counsel by words without knowledge? Many of us speak words, correct words, without knowledge. God loves you. Really? You won't walk to a prostitute on the street who is there because she was sold into the sex slave at 13 by her own father. She escaped and came back home and he took her back. That God loves her. You with your silver spoon. Really? Really? God, you know, <laughs> I give you an example. Someone I know who is going through a difficult point in their life right now. Um, they're, I'll say they're, they're going through, they're fighting through a divorce. It's a minister. He's going through a very difficult time in his life right now, and you know, God kind of laid him on my heart. And so for a while, you know, I've been, I'm a human being. I'm not perfect, but I've done my best to be there for him, and and. He's been asking my counsel and I'm always very careful to give it because I have never been through a divorce before. And I never will be by God's grace. So I'm very careful about telling him about what he should and should not do. I told him, like, I told him, tell me I said, you know, I know two things about God or three. He's God, he's just, and he loves me. I've told him those same thing, things about me. And me. <laughs> Does that make sense? So let me put it this way. This is how I said it. I'm saved. Does that make sense? I can guarantee you I'm born again. I will be just, meaning I will not be involved in anything that violates my spiritual compass. But I love you. I said, I want you to know that as long as you don't do anything I can point to the Bible and say is wrong, you have my support. Whatever decision you make. Because even if divorce is a sin, even if, even if, it is definitely not recorded in the Bible as the unforgivable sin. Right? Right? It's not. It's not worse than lying. Mm -hmm. And we let people who lie move on with their life. Does that make sense? I'm not saying it's a sin. I'm saying even if it is. Now, I do have strong views about it based on what I see in the Bible. But those are my views. Does that make sense? And even if they are right, it is not my place to dictate to another human being how they would. I can talk, I can beg, I can cry, but I cannot give the, I, I can't give the, the condition that if you don't do it my way, you can't count on me. That's, that's witchcraft. Does that make sense? If you don't stop smoking, no, 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 no. That, that, I made that mistake before, I ain't doing it again. Right? In your mess, even if it is a mess. As long as you are not telling me get out and you are not telling God. And even if you are telling God get out, I'll still be there to remind you he exists. Does that make sense? So you know what I did? I called a mentor of mine who's been through the same. I said, would you speak to this man for me? Don't, I'm not asking, and I made it very clear. I'm not asking you to convince him not to do this. I just want to give him someone to talk to who has been through it. 
so he can explore his emotions with the person. Whatever decision he makes is fine with me, but let him talk to somebody who he knows feels his pain because the person has been through it. Some of us don't qualify for that. We don't. We don't. And that's why God has kept us from some things. What are you going to say to a drug addict? What are you going to say? What are you going to say? God can deliver you. Has he delivered you from lying? You're going to say to a woman who lost her husband and her son in 12 months that God loves her. You can't give what you don't have. Hello. All around the world today, I get calls, texts, you know. I've forgotten what it feels like to pass on normal human beings sometimes. Because the last 12 months of my life, all I've done is pastor pastors who are on the brink. And I didn't even realize while I was doing it, I myself was in the same place. You know, so now you don't realize you're sleeping till you wake up. Minute, you know, you don't realize you're, you're ill till you get well. <laughs> Here I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown, dealing with people on the verges of nervous breakdowns. And I, I, it then became, it then made sense. Okay. It was good for me to be afflicted. The Bible says that I may learn your ways. Now I understand why I went through some of the things I went through. That's why God stopped and stood aside and watched me make some mistakes. I was asking God in the bathroom yesterday, why did you let me make some of these mistakes? Where were you? I was praying. He said, I shut up. I said, but you knew if I did this. And he said, yes, I knew. But there was no other way to teach you some things. Yeah, it's you. Yes, it's me. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Job says, look, 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 look. Oh, this is beautiful. This is just, this is just beautiful. Look at it, look at it, look at it. Look at it. It says, therefore, I now see I have rashly spoken what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I have virtually said to you that I have virtually said to you what you have said to me. Here, I beseech you and I will speak. I will demand of you and you declare to me. Verse five. I have heard of you only by the hearing of the ear. But now my eyes see you. You get that? I knew you before. But now my eyes see you. And God knows that this wrestling match will happen. Which is why as I close, he says in Isaiah 43. So if, if, you, if you don't understand what I've just said, Isaiah 43 looks like a nice scripture to you. But when you take it into consideration, now you understand what God means when he says in Isaiah 43. Are you there? Let's look at it. And I close with this. He says, but this is the amplified version. But now in spite of past judgment for Israel's sins, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, but he who formed you, O Israel, fear not for I have redeemed you. Uh, where, uh, there you are. <clears throat> Some things make your throat dry. Not the throat, just the thing you're talking about. Oh, Jacob, when he deformed you, Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. In bracket, ransomed you by paying a price instead of leaving you captive. I have called you by your name, you are mine. Beautiful, isn't it? Talk to me. Wonderful. In other words, Jesus loves me, yes, I know. For the Bible tells me. Yeah. Yeah. At the foot of the cross. Tell me where grace and mercy meet. Where you are my heart. Chase his ashes in love of you. Okay. That's salvation. Go verse 2. When you pass through. Uh, when? You know, some words in the Bible should set your hair on edge. You should become suspicious when you come across some words or some phrase. When? E.G. Matthew 6. When you pray. When you fast. When you give. It's not an if, it's a when. This one. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. But you pass through them. Through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. But they will, so they will submerge you. When you walk through. Some of us die because we don't walk through. We sit in the fire. 
analyzing, complaining, feeling sorry. I'm a living witness of what it feels like to sit in the fire. The Bible says you've got to walk through the fire. You will not be born or scorched. Nor will the flame kindle upon you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, blah, 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 blah. Verse 4, you're precious in my sight. I've loved you. Give men in exchange for you. Verse 5, fear not, I am with you. I will bring your, your children from the east. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. Someone say blah. Say blah. Say blah. Verse 17. Verse 16. 15. I am the Lord, your Holy One. The creator of Israel, your king. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters. So he he wouldn't have a job if there were no seas and no mighty waters. Does that make sense? His identity is he makes a way through impossible situations. So he needs impossible situations to keep his job. Hello. I, I grew up in a country where electricity was a luxury. But yet, that same country provides electricity for about five or six different neighboring countries. But it's a luxury in our country. And I didn't understand until about 16 years ago, I found out that at that time, two or three of the people on the board of directors or governors of the power company, two of them had businesses selling generators. One of them had a candle making business. You get the point? So you are in charge of making sure we have electricity, but you make your money by selling generators. How are we going to have electricity? Next time you call God a miracle working God, just stop and think about what you're saying. You're admitting you need the odd miracle. Next time you say you want to have a dead raising anointing, be careful. Someone close to you might need the anointing on... And so when that person dies, don't oh, yeah. just remember, oh, you're a miracle walking God. You're the Alpha and Omega. Who remembers that song? You're a miracle walking God. Hallelujah. Um, who brings for chariot and horse, army and mighty warrior? They lie down together, they cannot rise, they're extinguished, they are quenched like a lamp wick. So he's saying, the enemies that I allowed for a season, I'm going to destroy. Look at the process. First of all, he introduces himself to you as the one who can turn the situation around. Then he tells you that he would destroy the external enemies. Colon, verse 18. Do not. You see what happened between verse 17 and 18? In 15 and 16, God says, this is who I am. This is what I'm going to do. Right? Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Stay with me now. Hugo, stay with me, stay with me. I want you to get this, Hugo, like he can get it. Um, he says, I am so, 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 and so. So let's settle my identity, right? He's telling you, I is who I is. I'm for real, right? I'm legit. You can rest, a sh- you, I mean, how, how do I put that down? You can hold that, right? I'm for real. Then he says, I will take care of the things that were fighting you. I mean, that, that's cause for celebration, isn't it? Come on, let's start dancing. You know, I mean, let's, let's have a praise break. God says, I'm going to take care of your enemies. He says, I will extinguish them like a lamp wick, meaning I will snuff them out. But it doesn't end there. Then he gives an instruction in 18. He says, but you have something you need to do. Or the enemies I destroyed will make no difference. Do not remember the former things. Neither consider the things of old. Which former things? Like I said, there is no reason or rhyme. Behind when God decides to say, let there be light. He just decides. Say unto Zion, the time to favor her. Yes, the set time has come. But you're thinking, but well, nothing has changed. No, nothing needs to change. 
You're thinking, okay, you're like, no, it can't be time yet because no, no, there's nothing that need that you're looking for a sign that it's time. He's like, there's no sign. It's just time. Right? And you know when it becomes time for real? When he first, firstly, when he says it's time, and then secondly, when you believe it's time. He says, do not remember the former things. Don't remember the chapters where you were arguing with me. Forget about the wrestling match. You could, cause he, he, and, and, and like I said, I, I, I got a word this year. I played it to you guys two weeks ago. That really made me understand this. You know, the prophet said something, one line that just, just has been... He said, if you, he said, see, don't think about the way things did not work. Because that was a different season. He says, you were being tested. He said, then he went on and said, if you spend time trying to do it now the way you did it then you will slow me me meaning god you will slow me down does that make sense i've watched football teams that were bad one year and a new owner came and pumped all this money into it and bought all these expensive players the year before, the entire team was worth like 20 million. The year later, the team was worth like 400 million. But all these expensive players. It happened to Chelsea when Abramovich first came in. It happened to Man City when the Sheikh first came in. You know. But they forget. Okay, that's true. Some of you don't know football, right? Okay, imagine somebody buying House of Fraser. Or Dorothy Perkins. And changing the teals and, you know. Is that better now? Or Tony and Guy. Okay, Raja. Imagine somebody buying Raja. <laughs> somebody buying Raja, Otesco, Asda, Lidu, Morrison's, Audi, Adi, not Audi, Audi. Imagine somebody buying Raja and classing it up. So they bought all these expensive players, and they didn't change the coach. That's why some coaches don't do well in some teams. Not that they're bad coaches. This guy all his life has been playing with bad players. He's a great coach, but he's used to bad players. So he knows the only way he can beat a better team is to be defensive. Put four at the back. Four. The defenders and the midfielders are so close they can touch each other. Give you the ball and say, try and score. Then hope that there's one counter attack. But now he has better players. He can actually play and beat this team one-on-one. -on -one. But he's too used to his old tactics. Yeah. There are coaches in football who teams hire when they're fighting relegation. If you hire this guy, he'll get you out of relegation. <laughs> Make sure you give him at least half a season. Even if you were last in the league. If you hire him, you suck your hire him, he'll make sure you're not relegated. You put that same guy in a top four team. You'll be relegated. <laughs> For some of us, God is telling us, I have refurbished Raja. Please don't cut me to the same way you were cutting it before. <laughs> no. I bought new equipment. Do it with class. Zoom. Zoom. And this, listen, this might be frightening for someone. Don't charge the same prices as you were charging before. Your car hire company, your old cars were 1972 Buicks, 40 pounds per hour. And you upgrade and buy a Bentley. Don't charge 40 pounds an hour. You know why? Because the tire of a Buick costs 40 pounds. Tire of a Bentley. A friend of mine has a Hummer. He told me this year, or last year, he changed a tire on the Hummer for $300. Tire burst on the road. And it cost them almost $300. About 200 pounds, right? Or 180 or something, or 200 pounds. 
What's it, Taya? Taya, Alavax. Is, is it like, a, does it have a lunch pack inside, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, your new level is going to require a conscious act of forgetfulness of what happened to the old one. You're going to let, have to let God detox you. And I'm speaking from personal experience. They're going to have to detox you from what you've been through, what you've been subjected to, the paradigm of life you formed. You're going to have to believe you're smart, even though you flunked your first two years of uni. Let me not go any further. Let me close. I don't want some of you to burst out crying because I'm sure God is going to begin to deal with some very painful things. So I want you to make it home with your dignity intact. <laughs> Do not remember the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Behold. Meaning I'll only do all you're watching. Does that make sense? There's nothing there right now, but watch that space. It'll grow there. And most of them know, God, well, let me just do this. When you're done, let me know. No, I was like, no, I'm not going to start till you're there. And every time you take your eyes off, I'll stop. Does that make sense? Because I want you to see it coming up. God says, I, I need your conscious attention. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive and know it? Will you not give heed to it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. That's why he had to first introduce himself as a God. That made a way where there was no way. In essence, the new beginning is going to require the same God that you offended with to be what offended you in the first place. Does that make sense? The same way he wasn't fair and that got you into trouble. It's going to have to be unfair to bring you out. Does that make sense? Let me, Chris, if you're going to play, carry on and play. Um, this is going to be my last point and then I'm going to, going to close the service you're hurt because you think you deserved something and God hasn't given it to you and so you're disappointed a disappointment, disappointment means disappointment it means you had an appointment with something and it stood you up right it's a disappointment so I said I'd meet you at 4 o'clock you got there at four and I wasn't there. So you expected something. You felt you were entitled to something either because I said so or I inferred it by my behavior. And when the time came, you kept your end of the bargain, but in quote, God didn't keep his. So you are disappointed because you feel like God was unfair to you. You feel like you don't deserve what you had to endure. I got news for you. God is going to have to be unfair to give you what he wants to give you because you also don't deserve that. Do you get what I'm saying? Let's put it this way. You deserve, your salary is 2,000 pounds a month. Someone say amen. Somebody here who's earning less than 1,000 whose salary is about to be doubled and more over the next month or so, two months, or next few months, I don't know, but some point this year. Um, so your boss said, Two thousand pounds. Your your degree says, you know, the, the the general way it works with your kind of degree is that you get paid two grand a year, a month. And then your boss says, I'm gonna pay you one thousand. And you feel like you are so abused, right? I'm not gonna give any deep reason. I don't know why your boss, like I said, God doesn't need to have a reason. You no, know, we always like, oh, there's a reason he was teaching. You know, sometimes not teaching you anything. You just 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 yeah. hey, amen. Can we be real? He doesn't have to be teaching you anything. He just decides, I'm going to pay you a thousand. Like he told the guys who worked a whole day, you started in the morning, I'll give you a penny. He told the guys who started one hour before, I'll give you two a penny. The ones in the morning say, it's not fair. Say, what's your business? He said, am I evil because I choose to? Does that make sense? So you look at your, bo your friend. So, so Samantha, I'm paying privilege two grand. I'm paying you one grand. And you think that I hate you. I don't like you. I'm, 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 I'm despicable. It's so unfair. Um, newsflash. In three months time, when I decide to pay you five grand, 
she's going to think I'm unfair. That makes sense? So both you and I have been going through training. I've been going through training with your hatred to prepare myself for hers. Does that make sense? So what I've dealt with with you thinking I hate you will prepare me for her. On the flip side, <laughs> you know where I'm going, don't you? Okay. You don't always have to say it or say it the Lord to give a word. God's going to have to be unfair to create your new season. Does that make sense? He's going to have to break rules for you. He's going to have, Sammy, he's going to have to break some rules for you. Some people are going to be offended because of you. So, if, and I'm not claiming to speak for him, this is not part of my theory, I'm just, just speculating. Maybe God wanted to find out whether or not you were worth taking the hit for. Just maybe. Does that make sense? So, I, I don't know, I'm just, this just popped into my mind now. Could it be that God said, okay, if I'm going to be called unfair on her account, maybe I should see if she can handle me being unfair to her. For a short while and then I'll see if okay fine she could then I don't know I don't know if that I don't know I'd, I'd, I'd like to find that I just don't know I have questions I'm asking God about myself I have questions I'm asking about my people, people I love questions about people I don't like but I love people I both like and I do love and I have and I'm like God you know what just just answer all I can say is what I see and he says behold I'm going to do a new thing it will spring up I'll make a roadway in the wilderness I'll make a river in the desert the beasts and the owls will subject themselves to me and he goes on and on and on someone say on and on and on someone say on and on and on say on and on and on he goes on and on and on and on and on and on and see this is how much God loves us verse 21 the people that formed for myself they may set forth my praise meaning he's called us to reveal his glory through the new season after our pain because the, if there was no pain before the glory there would be no story it says but you have not called upon me you have been weary of me you haven't brought me your sheep and goats for burnt offerings you haven't honored me with your sacrifices i have not required you to serve with an offering or treated you as a slave by demanding tribute you have not bought me sweet cane with money or satiated me with the fat of your sacrifices you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. But I, even I, am he. In essence, God is saying, I do understand that the stuff you've been through has damaged some stuff on the inside of you. And you are not going to pray. Listen to me. Listen to me. You are not going to pray your way to this new level. You are not going to fast your way to it. Does that make sense? You are not going to earn it. God says, in fact, now that I'm about to do it for you, you are at your least zealous, your least consecrated, your least prayerful, your least holy. Does that make sense? Y'all are ready for this. Let me shut my Bible. I'll come back in a few weeks. I don't know. But I think you're ready. Are you ready to hear this? It violates your theology. <laughs> God is on, it's not unfaithful as to forget your labor of love. Does that make sense? The labor was when you were at your best. Then life happened and now you're at your worst. God's like, I'm not unrighteous as to forget. I will still pay you what I owed you when you were at your best because I know that it is by my mercies that I have the right to beseech you to present yourself a living sacrifice. God says, rather than rebuke you for your drop in quote, in consecration, I am going to encourage you by rewarding you for what you have done. Just stand, stand. Let's close there. Stand, stand. Let's pray. I, 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 I can tell when I'm starting to prophesy. And like I said, I don't want people to start crying. You know, you don't always have to prophesy to prophesy. You can preach and prophesy. Amen. Sometimes you're just preaching the Bible, and you can feel the same anointing when you're saying there's someone here. So lift up your hands and say, Lord, I receive a new beginning. I receive a new beginning. Give me grace to forget or not to remember the former things. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes. Now I give you glory. Oh. Now I give you all my praise. 
carry on what you're doing, Chris. I give you all of me. I give you all of me, yeah. Oh. I lay it all down. I lay it all down, yeah. I lay it all down, yeah. passing through town there was no deep he was just passing through his ministry was a traveling ministry and it was just on the agenda I know God had a mid reason in his mind but what I'm saying is in the natural realm there was no reason or rhyme to it and he heard that Jesus was in town and faith rose up in him and he began to press through people said this that shut up and he Bible said he cried out son of David have mercy on me eventually Jesus heard him and called him the Bible says he took off his cloak removed it and walked forward now many of us don't understand the significance of it to be a beggar in those days you had to have a deformity you were not allowed to beg if you were able-bodied you know like today's system and so they would give you a cloak that symbolized your deformity so when people saw this garment on you it meant you were a bona fide beggar. Then you were either blind or lame or, or emotional or mentally, but whatever it is, it was your license to beg. If you lost it, <laughs> Jesus says, Come. Bartimaeus has to take a leap of faith because what if he doesn't get healed? But now he's lost his ticket to welfare. The Bible says he, see, what that thing represented was his right to feel sorry for himself. He says, I am, you know, and, and I know this from experience. Sometimes our pain becomes comfort. It's our reality. We can always hold on to the fact that I was abused as a child. It, it's a source of, of uh, does that make sense? Uh, it, it's, it's at least we, we, we don't feel bad about feeling sorry for ourselves. When we misbehave, I mean, have you ever done something stupid and, and comforted yourself about, well, I was going through a hard time? True? Come on, talk to me. You spoke to someone, you know, you, you damn it, I, I give an example, you, 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 you got fired at work because you came late or you, or you were rude to your boss. You say, well, you know, I was going through a hard time. It, it, it makes it easier to, to. 
and 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 the first step to healing is being able to discard the identity of deformity and say you know what it's cool i'm not a beggar anymore i'm not gonna be blind anymore i'm not gonna wear this garment of and then and i i i i had to work through that myself I woke up one day and i said you know what i'm not gonna be the guy who's been mistreated anymore be the guy who's been who's been hurt now and i'm like no that's not my identity that's not my identity it's not oh, well, 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 you know but what you know because i'll give an example can, can, can i be real can i can i can i deal with my personal life a little bit can you handle you know um so here i am i'm i'm, I'm pastoring the ministry pastoring the church and, and 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 at that time the the church isn't doing as well as it should be doing because i'm heartbroken and i'm in a very bad place but every time i look at the records and they're not doing as well as they should be doing i have that to hold on to well, I am going through a hard time. That makes sense. Well, I have been this. Have been. So it, 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 it kind of comforts me that, well, you know what? We're not where we should be, but the reason why we're not where we should be is this. So, so it makes me feel better. Now, it's a very dangerous thing because if I decide to throw in my right to feel that way, then I, longer have, I no longer have an excuse for my ineptitude. So the next time I see stuff is not how it should be, then I have to accept that there's something wrong with me. And that's a very painful thing to admit. Does that make sense? Take an example. You are the school, right? Okay, so I'm not prophesying. So Sammy, you know, uh, uh, what, what are you on course for? First, uh, no, I'm on course for 2-2. Two, two. I know you didn't get 2-2. Two, two. I'm on course for 2-2, two, two, but, but no, it was because yeah, my grandmom died when I was in school. You know, and all those things come up very quickly. You know, you know, are you getting a first no, but and this is the but something happened to me. So it makes you feel now what you don't realize, what I found out, not by the spirit, by just life, is the person who didn't go through is not impressed by it. All they heard is you got a tutu. All the time you spend explaining why is wasted. So don't bother explaining. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? How many clients does the business have? Well, you know, we only have we don't, we don't have any clients yet, but but we've been doing our website. No, 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 no. If I'm a bank, am I going to accept that as a reason for giving you a loan? No. How many clients do you have? Zero. Come back when you have some. Hey, but you don't understand the reason why we haven't yesterday marketing is we're getting our website done. We're furnishing another, you know, and you know this happened and that happened, and you know, and then, and then the, the, the website, the bank doesn't care. Do you have enough clients to justify your loan? Sorry. So you're going to have to. Does that make sense? It's okay. Let him. Let him. You're going to have to discard that reality to become effective and refuse to be named by your pain. I am not. See, my book is almost out. You you read some stuff about me. I'm not that dude. I was not abused at five sexually. I wasn't. Somebody called the Lumide was that dude is long dead. I am not the product of a single parent home. I was, but not anymore. That dude is dead, dead, buried. Now he didn't die without a fight. He didn't die without a fight. Tell me, in my twenties, I was scared of the dark. In my twenties, the dark, the dark. Don't say the dark. I was. Imagine a twenty-something-year-old dude. I don't, I mean petrified. Literally like, yeah, yeah. so you know how I faced you know how I dealt with it? For two weeks God made me pray in the dark. That's why I love praying in the dark now. For two weeks, God like I will not talk to you unless you put up the light. And then one day he gave me a vision of what was going on. And I saw about five, six wolves or or, 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 or wild dogs circling me. And I said, You see why I don't like praying in the dark? God, you see, they were snarling. You know when their jaws were dripping with saliva, and then one of them jumped at me to bite me. And as I was bracing for the attack, I had a sound, and I saw him on his back. And then I saw a wall of angels, so tight you couldn't pass air through them. Each of them's chest, the size of my roof, in a circle around me. Now, I would never have seen that vision. If I wasn't scared of the dark, I've been a normal person who was just not scared of the dark. 
but you know but now I love the dark I come alive at night I love playing in the dark news flash you've been to Nottingham before so those, uh, it, 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 it heightens be- now because my but I have to face it head on there are times where I, halfway through praying I'd get up and just put up the light and I can't do this I can't do this I just can't do this I'm the 20 something year old dude don't say dude no girl I'm a dude I'm a big, I'm a big man on campus you know in court each of us have something like that one more time lift up your hands and say God heal me go and tell him say, Lord heal me it might not be a one day thing but the process can start in one day prepare me for my new beginning God doesn't judge like I said he doesn't judge you have it he says you are you're not doing what you should do but that's cool I still love you anyway and I understand and I know I will not get you back on your feet by condemning you he says I know the only way to restore you is to encourage you and that's what he wants to do in this season